You are listening to That's What I Call Marketing with your host, Connor Byrne. Welcome to That's What I Call Marketing, the podcast where you will hear from the leading lights in the marketing world and listen to their unique insights. Don't forget to rate or review this episode wherever you are listening or watching. It really helps us reach and build on this amazing, engaged community of marketers just like you. And if you're interested in getting involved with That's What I Call Marketing, our sponsorship kit is available on our website. That's what I call marketing.com forward slash sponsor. Get in touch with us and we can work together on creating a series of content that works for you and your brand. Well, I read a quote from Peter Field that said, any brand with ambitions beyond its budget needs to see this. Well, I needed to find out what he was referring to. And in this instance, he was referring to Bountiful Cow's IPA study, which analyzed 256 ad campaigns examining them for relative advantage. I tracked down Adam Foley, CEO of Bountiful Cow, to ask him more about the analysis and the findings. The research argues that relative advantage campaigns are 15% more likely to show at least one very large brand effect. They are also 60% more likely to have a very large effect on awareness, 22% more likely on differentiation, suggesting a longer term benefit to the brand and the business. As Adam himself has said, when you can't outspend your competition, you have to outthink them. You'll never win by doing the same thing with less money. It's about seizing opportunities that competitors overlook or neglect. This episode delves into the report with great real life examples of brands that are using the principles of relative advantage. We cover the importance of challenger brands, how diverse and non-traditional approach to marketing and audience engagement can result in significant company growth and brand awareness. We talk about leveraging social currency and the critical role of measuring campaign effectiveness. So, Let's get into this episode all about challenging the way we think about growth. And we'll get into that just after a word from our sponsors. Today's show is supported by the Indie List, the leader in providing you with easy access to hundreds of highly experienced marketers quickly and cost effectively. Visit the IndieList.ie to speak to the Indie List team today. Are you facing the maze of global expansion? Diplomat introduces the Diplomacy Model, a cost-effective, innovative approach to navigating the complexities of your brand's presence in international markets. Visit Diplomat.agency. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities. Adam, thanks a million for joining me on That's What I Call Marketing. Great to have you here. Thanks, Connor. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, listen, um, I'd love to get a bit about your your background, kind of your your origin story. Uh, tell me, can you tell me about your background? Because I, I, it's going to be just interesting, kind of, to where you've landed now and, and uh, kind of why you're doing what you're doing. Of course, God. Well, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> school. <laughs> school. No, no. Do you really? You want to go back to school? <laughs> the, the linear or non-linear path you've had. Okay. Well, so in terms of my career, I suppose. Um, well. D- it was kind of a bit, I, I, you must get this a lot, but it was all a bit of a mistake. Um, there was no kind of, there was no real plan. But I remember I was um, I was at Glastonbury, I think it was in 1999 and uh, Sunday morning. And a lot of things can happen at Glastonbury <laughs> on Sunday morning. And I thought, oh God, I should get a job. I just finished university and I didn't have anything lined up. And I left the festival at some point and there's... I went to uh, Castle Kerry train station, which um, if you've been to Glastonbury, you'll know. And the train west goes home to Devon, where I'm from, and the train east goes to London. And I thought, well, I should go to London and get a job. (laughs) So I did that. I went to London and I got a suit. And then on Tuesday, I was in some kind of like weird um, uh, kind of group interview (laughs) situation um, for... Uh, for a, for a post selling classified advertising for food manufacture magazine, <laughs> and um, uh, and also manufacturing chemist and is the inside cosmetics because it was kind of a, a little group. So I, I got the job and I, I got a business card that said food and fine chemicals <laughs> department. And then um, I went home to Devon on the Friday and said, I'm going, I'm moving to London. I've got a job. I think I think I was home for about <laughs> half an hour between university and and and, and leaving home. And then um, and then for for one reason or another, it didn't work out. I. I did okay, but I don't think it was my true yep. calling. And um, I, I was, I got to around um, Christmas time 
of that year. So I'd been there for about three or four months. And uh, I was living in Paddington. And I used to walk past a pub called the Dudley Arms quite a lot. And there was, uh, on the corner, I saw something called Zenith Media. And I thought, well, I should just work there. <laughs> and then, um, so I spoke to a recruitment consultant and they said, well, there is a job in the regional press department. Do you, you know, do you want to go for that? I just thought, well, yeah, okay. You know, I, I, naively, I thought I'd be home in time every day for neighbours <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I worked there. But that's not quite how media agencies work, it turns out. Anyway, so um, I got I got the job, and there I was in you know, and that's that's when my sort of media career proper started. That is I dead. I have heard some definitely non-linear paths to career, but I'm going to give you the most <laughs> random, like sliding doors moment. What happened if you'd gone on the Devon train? <laughs> we will, we'll, well, we'll there you go. Know. Yeah. Well, I, I could have gone back to my job at Burger King <laughs> where I used to work. So yeah. Uh, who <laughs> was headlining on in Glastonbury? Do you remember? That's a good question, actually. Um, I think it was REM, but I didn't see them. Um, Manic Street Preachers, but I didn't see them. And someone else that I didn't see. I, I, it was one of those ones where you just go and yeah. do other <laughs> Good times, good times. <laughs> yeah. um, so from there, obviously, yeah, and I love the ambition to get home and watch Neighbours. Um, it, it's, mm. yeah. Failed. Failed it's, it's still a great show. Um <laughs> but so from there, you continued on in media agencies. I'd love to hear the kind of the story about kind of you getting to that point. Yeah. So um, what happened was so I, I started working in regional press, and and this is this is a kind of theme I suppose that goes through my sort of personal life and my professional life is that I quickly realised that not many people wanted to work in the regional press team. It was kind of a there was a famous, there was a phrase that went around the agency going don't break bread with regional <laughs> press, you know. So that just made me wanted to do it more, and I got really passionate about it and started to it's like everyone you know has got a picture of themselves in the yeah, local yeah, newspaper yeah. you know and it's like it's where all the stories uh, are told about real people and things that really matter to, to people that aren't really reported on elsewhere and there's stuff like um you know it sounds like a really trite thing to say but everything has to happen somewhere so often uh, local papers would break the biggest stories so you know the Harold Shipman story was broken by the yeah, Manchester yeah. Evening News because they were the first people to start to, to pick up on it so I started to realize how important it was and how um, like kind of vital a tool of democracy and and that kind of made me um, I don't know just, just just become it gave me a sort of purpose in my early career I suppose and um, you know I, I was really driven to, 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 to promote it to our clients and that got me really close to BT who were um, the biggest press advertiser in the UK at that time. And um, I was working on their business and then, then they pitched it and it ended up moving to an agency called Starcom, which I'm ashamed to say I hadn't okay. heard of when, when, when we lost the business. And it was a bit like, because at the time Zenith was like this, we used to get booed at um, pub quizzes because Zenith was like the Death Star because it was the biggest <laughs> agency and it didn't really have any competition. So this is like 99, 2000. So when... Then it started to lose business to you know companies like Mediacom and and Starcom. It was a bit like how how's, how is this happening? But then BT got in touch and said that they would like they would like Starcom to take me over with oh, wow. with the business. And um, so I went and sort of set up a regional press department, which they didn't have at Starcom across Starcom and MediaVest, the two agencies. Um, MediaVest had a regional press department and Starcom didn't. So um, I kind of worked on, on on pulling those two things uh, those two things together, and then eventually became. Um, sort of moved into more of a planning role on, on BT more generally. And then from there, I um, started to get into the strategy world. So um, we won a couple of music clients, EMI uh, Music, and um, I was kind of a, a, a natural fit for it in, in that I knew a bit about music and a bit about media, but nothing about strategy. So I sort of made it up as I went along. And um, there was, it was kind of... Um, I guess it was a really big moment for me on on that because I had a sort of a big moment of failure where um, we and it's funny in retrospect, but because I probably didn't know entirely what I was doing at that point, um, but I, I kind of had an, had an inkling. The Terra Firma um, were a kind of private equity company that bought EMI, and we ended up in a um, position where we we lost the planning and the strategy to um uh, to seven stars which is the company i the group i work for now and it you know it 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 was a moment i got a real low in my career that something i was so passionate about and cared so much about but um had failed in some way professionally 
uh, kind of really was a moment where I got my got my shit together, I guess. And at that moment, I was kind of determined to to, to really prove that I could do it. And then um, about eighteen months later, we we got back onto the account, and um, you know, and, and and from there, I started to build my um, position as a strategist within the oh agency. My, amazing! It's uh, and it's, I just when you're naming all the agencies, I'd love to know who comes up with them, makes them sound like something out of Battlestar Galactica, you know, Zenith, <laughs> Starcom. It's like. <laughs> I always thought Media Vest was a weird name, yeah. and, and, and it took me ages to realise it was to do with investment rather a than a sort of a item of clothing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm still not quite sure what a Media Vest looks like. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's that song from The Simpsons? Uh, anyway, there's a there's a Simpsons song. Oh, so God. <laughs> yeah, I know what anyway. you mean. Um, so <laughs> your your focus now is, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but it is kind of on in the area of challenger brands. That's where you kind of are investing your time. I, I'd love to know what got you into that. What was it about the that? Because it's quite, like, I guess, it's a niche in a way. Like, what is it that you found interesting, and the gap, I guess, as well, um, that, that you identified. Okay, so it is a bit of a non-linear path, and you did ask me about school, so I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that. So. Um, <laughs> when I was when I was at school and um, it's like the early you know when you go into like big school so like 11 onwards and um, I sort of stopped I was doing okay at my like the school before that but I, I, I sort of lost um, focus a little bit as, as, you, as you tend to do and become interested in stuff outside school like you know skateboarding <laughs> and smoking <laughs> and, and whatever and um I, I, I was sort of drifting a bit and then I was in this English class and we had this teacher called Mr. Finn who, he, the way he would he'd set you these um, uh, uh, like homework by writing the title of a, uh, a story he wanted you to write on the, on the blackboard and he wrote on there um, no one knows what my teachers really like but I do because I'm their son and we all had to go away and write a story about that and everyone wrote a story which was how this teacher who everyone hated at school was this absolute sweetheart when you you got home apart from me and i was i wrote a story about how there was this like teacher who everyone loved at school but at home was kind of modeled more on the lines of sort of genghis khan or (laughs) or or something and and um and i got called to the front of the class and i thought i was in trouble because i'd done it differently and actually the teacher said you know this is a really good lesson where if you figure out what everyone else is doing and you need to do the opposite you'll get more noticed and actually I think I started to take that all the way through everything I did and to varying degrees of success in my sort of like uh, haircuts <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and hairstyles and things all of which taught me some pretty useful lessons about running and hiding which is again very good advice for early 2000s media agencies but it, um, it also taught me that if you do things differently, then you, it, it's easier to, to kind of stand out. It's easier to get noticed, I guess. And that, I suppose if you think about the regional press, mm. um, uh, uh, my career and that, it's the same thing, really. It's like if you find something that other people aren't really doing and kind of try and make a name for yourself there, you, you, you can do. So when I, when I went to Starcom, because Starcom kind of grew out of Motive, which was the um, media department of BBH. So in, in our reception, we had the famous um, Levi's yeah, Black yeah. Sheep. And I sort of took it as my personal instruction every day to go in there and try and find out what everyone else is doing and, and do the opposite. So it's kind of, it, it kind of fitted with my personality. And I always swore that if I ever ended up sort of running an agency, that would be the approach I'd want to take. So when I got to Bountiful Cow, which is, um, you know, is, is run by the Seven Stars, uh, Seven Stars Group or owned by the Seven Stars Group, um, that was very much the kind of thinking as soon as we came in because, you know, we are a challenger business by by dint of our size and, um, and our capability. But... Uh, the type of clients we work with as well so we wanted to make sure that we had a kind of challenger philosophy running through running through everything we did. it's so funny that you mentioned I, I didn't know obviously the bbh connection but as you were talking all i was thinking mm. about was the zig and zag of bbh like yeah the, yeah know, and that's fascinating that's kind of how you you really connected to that and kind of finding a different a different path to you know to do and again the yeah the regional press is is very interesting in that like that kind of speaks to that um so challenger brands, how, how are you defining a challenger brand? It's a really good question because there are lots of ways in which you can um, uh, you can be a challenger now because, you know, I, I, I guess the, the, the way we, what we wanted to do was when you look at a lot of the rules that are, are written nowadays for brands and, you know, and you think about things like Byron Sharp, which are incredibly valuable and, um, and important, but the 
the, the rules that are, that are kind of laid out aren't always um, available to challengers. They can they can be flawed for challengers because they they often tend to highlight the advantages of being large mm-hmm. in the first place, not necessarily how to grow. So it's been widely shown and proved, and we're, you know we're not disputing that this is true. But a disproportionately higher excess share of voice is required to grow. I guess while we're not disputing that, the question we are asking is, what do you do Don't have that. if you can't yeah, yeah. do that, or you haven't got the money to do that? Yeah. So. Or at least, are there other ways to think about achieving excess, excess share of voice beyond just spending more? And there was this, um, this is great quote by Philippe Thomas, which just says, if everyone has got the same strategy, then no one can win, especially when your pockets aren't as deep as others. So uh, uh, the challenges our clients face are, 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 are different um, and, and in every category. And they can, it doesn't have to be about necessarily size. It can be about kind of trying to redefine a category that's, that's, that's outlived its, its course or that you've outgrown. So um, we, we think about our clients' um, uh, challenges in different ways. And we've created this proposition we think can, can help, us, um, uh, help us address that. So they can be any size, they can be, it could be, you know, like it could be an older brand that's trying to re-establish itself, you know, has lost its way a bit. So it's not necessarily to do with new to market necessarily, but you probably have a mix of that as well. Yeah, exactly that. Exactly that. Um, Why, um, you kind of touched on it there a bit, but in terms of the need to behave differently in, in media, why do challenger brands, from your experience, need to behave differently in media? Probably some of it is to do with budget. I get that. But if they, if there may be a larger brand and they're kind of trying to redefine themselves and rechallenge, you know, they're maybe dropped to third in the market or fourth in the market trying to challenge. What is it? That, why is it that they need to kind of behave differently in, in media? Well, I think to, to, to most people, we all have to start from the uh, the point of view that advertising is, is kind of looks like wallpaper. And I forget the number, but we're exposed to, you know, thousands yeah. of messages um, every day. And there's too much advertising that's that's really blah. And if you just become part of the wallpaper, a sea of sameness, and the brands just blur into each other and they're easily forgotten and easily ignored. And I think that the, the one thing that we all need to remember is um, quite how fierce the competition for attention is. And I know the, the concept of attention as a, as a metric is, is, is kind of widely talked about at the moment, but I think we really need to think about what that means because in everyone's pocket is everything that's ever been made by anyone and everything that's ever being made, which is, you know, ever, ever growing um, kind of cascade of information and content all the time. That's the bar. You know, that's the competitive set and we all need to wake up to that as an industry and, and, and think about what we're doing. So even if you are the biggest spending, uh, biggest spender in the, in, in the category, are you just contributing to that wallpaper? Or are you, have you got something more interesting to, to, to put in front of people? Because you, you almost, you, the competition is everything that anyone could be doing instead and which is right. everything. So that, 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 that puts you into a, um, a, a really different space and no one is going to solve that problem by playing it safe. And, you know, what we, we talk to the brands we work with and say is that you won't beat your biggest spending competitors by spending less money in the same places, reaching the same people w- with the same thing. And, um, you know, th- we want to encourage brands to, to think differently about what they're saying, how they're saying it. But, you know, I guess our core uh, area of responsibility is, is where okay. they're saying yeah, it. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's good. And there is so much sameness, isn't there? Like, it's just a lot, a lot, a lot out there. Um and it's, yeah, kind of interesting how you're right, like stuff just kind of blends in and is invisible, right? I think we forget that, I think, in this industry. And it, like we've talked about a lot on, you know, on the podcast is that, you know, we, we're so invested in what we're doing, particularly if you work client side, I think, because you live and breathe it all the time. Yeah, it's the, it's the biggest isn't danger, it? isn't it? And there's a great Dave, Dave Trott quote, uh, quote, wait, quote, a great Dave Trott quote. Where he, he talks about research and he says, um, the, the best thing to do when you get a brief is to sit down and write about everything you know about the brand before you start reading anything, because it's the last point at which you're thinking like a normal human being. <laughs> and um, I think I think that's really, really That is important. so good. It is so good. Um, yeah, because it, <laughs> I love that start thinking like a human being, because like, we just don't, like, we don't, we get so into the importance and it's, it ends up in work I think that is kind of inside out do you know what I mean because even then we're, we're like oh mm. we have to say all mm. these things about us and what we're doing and how great we are and it's like oh, nobody cares <laughs> like you know yeah that's a really yeah. good way of putting it inside where's, out where's yeah exactly that um, you've, you've analysed 236 am I right with the number 236 campaigns in the IPA database yeah, uh, yeah. to prove your 
the relative advantage framework. Tell me about the relative advantage framework. Okay. Um, so the thing is, Connor, having worked at uh, a few media agencies, I went to a media owner for The Guardian for, for seven years, but media agencies tend to have all have a planning process. And what I noticed at the media agencies I'd worked at was that you, you, they tended to be replaced quite quickly. Often, you know, you'd have more than one a year, which kind of highlighted the fact that um, they, they weren't often that used by everyone in the agency, least of all the strategists who come up with them. And when I got to Bountiful Cow and we started talking about it, we realised that everyone had, had the same experience. So we thought, why don't, why, why don't we not have one? Why do we, uh, we don't need a planning process as such, but we do want a kind of um, a principle that everyone in the agency can understand and use and buy into, which is easier, easier mm -hmm. said than done. But I wanted to, to get to, to something that everyone here, no matter what role they have, can, can, can apply to everything they do within, within the business. And um, to kind of enshrine our challenger spirit, we, we, we change the values of the agency as well. Now, every agency has got values, but they're usually things like, you know, um, um, be brave or, you know, um, uh, uh, be kind or, or, or whatever, which is, are all well and good, but they, t they tend to be um, shared by a lot of people. One thing I noticed when I got here is we have a lot of um, uh, cow puns in okay. everything, and some are more successful <laughs> than others. Uh, I, I, I struggle to explain to my dad, for instance, why our weekly meeting is called Moo. Um, but uh, we, we thought there could be some values, um, challenger values we could have that, that would really um, enshrine that spirit in everything we do. So one is um, uh, no bullshit. So we, we, we like to tell the truth to our clients no matter how uncomfortable. And it's also about how we run our business because we, we're sort of ultra transparent um, uh, to, to, to a degree I've not seen in any other business, and which is great and helps me sleep at night. But it's also about how we, um, you know, how, how we deal with our clients and how we uh, try and address, you know, just kind of shake them out of that inside yeah. out thinking you, 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 you talked about before. And the second value is uh, no sacred cows because we don't think there are any questions that you, you shouldn't answer, ask. So we ask the questions that others might not want to. And the third is um, don't follow the herd, which is exactly what I talked about before. Let's find out what everyone else is doing and then um, see what the opposite looks like. And it might not always be where you end up, but it's a pretty good place to start. So th those were our values. And then we started to think about how can we kind of um, uh, take the essence of those and, and, and put that into a principle which uh, informs all of our work. And what we got to is, is relative advantage, which is so simple, but it's just like we find the clear spaces um, where our competitors have, have neglected or overlooked. And that's where we grow brands. So you can get excess share of voice if you're investing into a space where your customers are, where, which is effective, but where um, your competitors are yeah. not. <clears throat> that's it and what we do is we, we look for that in um, in media um, so media spaces competitors aren't using uh, audiences they might not be reaching uh, times of day that aren't being used or times of year um, social currency or thought leadership or even distribution you know finding places to, to sell products that aren't being used by the competitors right <clears throat> Brilliant um, example of that for me was when I was working at Indeed uh, in the US, their big competitor mm. was ZipRecruiter and Indeed had had a kind of avoided advertising in podcasts. So doing anything on, on any podcast platform and they were all over it. They were all over it, investing ah. incredibly heavily. Um, I think it was like the, maybe the Bill Burr one where like he was kind of almost taking the piss oh, yeah. out of the name ZipRecruiter. Like it was just, but you know, he, they let him do it and, oh, and they were stealing share. They were stealing share from India yeah, and became yeah. like a, a real, oh, we need to, we need to wake up to this. But you're kind of then behind the game a little bit, right? And you're kind of, you know, so what do you do? And <clears throat> really interesting. So it's just a kind of a, as you were talking there, you, you have, again, I found, read this, that with, Brands that follow the relative advantage principles were, I love numbers, 61% more likely to see very large awareness growth and 17% more likely to re receive commitment from customers. Tell me a bit more about that. 17% mm. more commitment from customers. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, the as you said, we, we did um, 236. Um, we, looked, we found 236 um, uh, examples. Should I sort of talk for a bit of the, the yeah, methodology, how we, how we put it all together? So it was, um, it was kind of a group effort within the agency we went we started talking to peter field and lawrence green at the ipa and I, they, they were really interested because i don't think anyone's or an agencies aren't really working with them in this way to kind of use the data bank to prove uh, approve a hypothesis so they were um very close to us on the methodology all the way through to make sure that it would it would kind of stand up but 
we wanted to find examples in the data bank of relative advantage and, and, and important things when we were looking at those examples when we we're going through the the studies we were blind to the results so we were only uh, choosing brands that kind of followed followed the principles we then removed all the outliers so we took um, both large brands and niche brands out so that it was kind of uh, you know in the in the mid market everything we did was a kind of com all the examples we looked at were commercial uh, for profit I think two-thirds of them were operating in low growth stagnant or declining categories so we wanted to remove you know the effect of an already successful uh, successful category out of there and what we found was that um, um, I guess it, it looks like a kind of classic funnel that brands that use relative advantage were more likely to see awareness growth at the top they're more likely to see consideration in the middle and more likely to deliver results at the bottom 15% um, of them were more likely to generate at least one very large brand effect so that's uh, things like awareness differentiation esteem and commitment so bringing new people to the brand uh, by by its nature, that's what relative advantage does. Um, but we think the reason it, it, it kind of uh, improved things like commitment because it it, it would it, by operating in a different space, you, you stand for something to 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 the audience, and they're more likely to to stick around as a result. We also saw that brands were twenty one percent more likely to see two very large um, brand effects. So it was clearly having a big impact on on brand effects, but also in uh, business business effects as well. So there was a nine percent uplift in very large business effects like sales, acquisition, and profit. And more likely than the control to show four or more um, very large uh, business effects. So right. um, we were really, really pleased with that. I think we were really pleased with the, um, and particularly the esteem and commitment results, because I guess when we've been, we were sort of trialing the concept, some clients could, you know, express a, a concern early on that there's a reason why every, everyone advertises in the same way. Mm. There's a reason why stepping outside that could damage perceptions. But that's really not what we saw. We saw that using relative advantage doesn't do any damage at all. Uh, improves trust but hugely improves esteem so we think breaking the norms displays an air of confidence or, or we'll be right back after these today's show is brought to you by the indie list cmo collective this service from the indie list provides you with access to a curated range of highly experienced and talented senior marketing specialists visit the indie to find out more are you facing the maze of global expansion Diplomat introduces the Diplomacy Model, a cost-effective, innovative approach to navigating the complexities of your brand's presence in international markets. Visit Diplomat.agency. That's really interesting because, I, yeah, I agree with you. Like, there, there, there surely is a belief that, well, of course we're on these platforms because, you know, our competitors are there. If we're not there, we're not seen to be as trust you know as trusted as them or what you know trustworthy as them that's so that's really interesting finding because like, like for any cha i guess challenger brand but I, like lots of brands are faced with budget constraints you know like you, we don't all have the money of the big brands and so to understand that actually you can be in other places and still build esteem and trust is is really powerful um to, you know to get to um you said you worked with Peter Field, and I know he he said uh, any brand with ambitions beyond its budgets needs to have a look at your the seven principles that you uncovered, which is high praise from the man himself. Mm. Um, so, uh, do you want to talk? To, can we talk through the seven principles? Because I I think they're kind of really useful, really interesting, and kind of almost actionable for for anyone who's listening to this. Yeah, definitely. And I think, um, you know, the, the question you raised just a second ago about, you know, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to advertise in a different place. You can show up in a different way. I think, um, you know, for luxury brands, for example, the company you keep is so important because actually that helps people um, understand your business in a context, right? So, but it, you, you, you can show up in uh, by thinking about the, the thought leadership you display or the, or the kind of social currency. So the, 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 the seven ways to approach it are, are useful because it's not always just about different yeah. media. And that so one, can, can I just uh, ask it, about that, talk about the company you keep? Mm. Do you mean neighborhood of brands yeah. or... Yeah, mm. yeah, okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think, um, and especially if your brand's less established, it's it's important that you, uh, you're able to show where yeah. you belong. And we did a bit of research back along when I was at The Guardian that um, showed that you know, media placement was as important as, as creative for, for people understanding what a brand is and, and how it fits in. So, you know, from a consideration point of view, I think that's really important. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I remember, again, conversations before about that where we were trying to convince people that, you know, a brand showing up in a place with other brands would just increase 
kind of the perceptions of the brand as kind of a grown up trusted brand. Anyway, let's get into your seven principles. Mm. I don't, they're not yours, but you sure. Know. So, they're, they're definitely not <laughs> ours and like, i guess that's the point isn't it you know that's why we want to use the ipa data bank because we wanted to show examples beyond our bar, beyond our four walls so um the, the the first is audience so if we think about um an audience um there's uh, you know the latest census showed like quite how much the uk population um is changing and that creates a huge amount of uh, opportunity to understand diverse audiences um uh, for example um and think about how how we can better connect um, with those audiences and how they relate to your, your product or category and nationwide's a brand that's done some um, some good work in that space but it's you know it's an area i think we all we all need to improve in um media channels um we've talked about a little bit but that's that's really important so uh one of the examples we sh- we, we saw in the um in the research was that wagamama using cinema uh, in a category that um hasn't used it you know a, a kind of um a, a kind of brand corporate level but of course we all remember going to the cinema when we were younger you know adverts for restaurants uh, around the corner yeah, yeah. so it felt like a, a bit, bit of a circle closing there but you know they they used that to, to to enormous effect and were able to demonstrate the effectiveness of doing it and the third is day part. Um, so, you know, just thinking about um, lots of uh, our brands tend to kind of flock together at, at certain points, you know, particularly at peak. But then we saw um, Deliveroo as a really good example um, who came to this sort of a stunning insight, but so true, that outside London, people tend not to eat dinner at 9 p.m. <laughs> uh, people eat dinner a lot earlier. And they found none of their competitors were advertising in late afternoon or early evening. Um, so, again, we're able to kind of like uh, own that space and, uh, you know, to great effect. So, right. Another example of relative advantage is uh, seasonality. Um, my favourite case study in this space was for Australian lamb. So lamb traditionally is a meat associated with um, uh, with, with spring. Australian lamb kind of pulled that forward um, where there's um, out of a competitive space and into January. Now, after Christmas, not many uh, meat brands were advertising, but there was a clear space around uh, Australia Day. Mm. So they spent 10 years um, making lamb the focus or the, the kind of uh, uh, the official yes, meat yeah. partner for Australia Day and, you know, being on all those barbecues and again, kind of, you know, uh, uh, created their own their own space. And they did some they did a, some really good work around that. This, I've uh, seen, this I saw year. the I stuff this year. It, so good. It was the generational one, wasn't it? Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So yeah. So it got to a point where they, they owned yeah. that moment so much they could sort of almost start talking about something else. And that's that's a 10 year project um, all the way through. Um, so that's been really good. Um, uh, thought leadership and social currency are other areas you can you can start to own. So Ellis Kitchen, for example, have, you know, position themselves as the expert on on weaning, and then there's distribution. You know, how do you how do you find um, new ways to, to to sell your product or new places to sell your product? Amazing. I mean, there's there's so much in there. So many different kind of pieces of, um, I, you know, just even taking one of those, I think you can start. Like, like, I'm just thinking, if someone listening to this say, going, well, I can't do all seven, but like, even if you just think about one, like I think about, I'm based in Ooh. Ireland, you talked about kind of the audience in the UK is changing. Again, same in Ireland, you know, huge diversity. I mean, you look back yeah, Ireland 20 years, it was pretty, yeah, pretty the same, you know, but there's been changes of kind of the d- demographic structure of Ireland and it's, it's brilliant. But actually, and I've done some work recently with a, a dairy brand and we found there is like Irish kind of historical consumption of dairy is well known right because you know it's part of kind of upbringing but some of the newer audiences that that we're communicating with it's not part of kind of their their background and their heritage and their story so actually how do you start thinking about them now it's just a very interesting thing to start thinking about it okay but that's then you kind of delve into those questions right so kind of i probably each one might lead you on to one of the other of the seven principles yeah, definitely. And, you know, and I think um, we've had some, we were pitching for a fast food brand uh, back end of last year. And um, we're talking to, um, we've got a guy from India in the team who was saying, um, you know, actually for him, this brand represented, um, it was more about the chicken products and the, the, the meat products that they, um, the beef products that they do, because um, uh, as part of his background, um, beef is not a huge, yeah. um, uh, you know, uh, so it's something that should be, is often on the menu. So, and again, it makes you think about things in a completely different way. It can often get you to, to completely clear yeah, spaces. Which is, and it's kind of, it kind of goes then to the importance, I think, as well, of having within teams and within kind of whether it's marketing team or media agency or creative agency is kind of diversity of thinking because without it, we're all going to just kind of have the same, you know, the same thinking, right? Yeah, I, I completely. I went to um, Bletchley Park about 10 years ago and it was really interesting. It was sponsored by Google 
um, which I thought was sort of all well and good. I guess it's the sort of um, you know the, the forerunner of everything everything they do. But there was a, a, a note attached to it. Just said talked about the kind of diversity of the team at Bletchley Park because you had um, uh, a lot of um, uh, women who weren't um, uh, you know contributing to the kind of the, the kind of physical uh, war effort a lot of shopkeepers obviously Alan Turing himself was was famously gay but having lots of different brains focusing on um, a, a problem uh, they they credit it as being one of the uh, one of the things that enabled them to kind of crack the enigma code because they were thinking about it approaching it in such different ways and I think it's really important in the workplace that that you have that and um, you know diversity of thinking diversity of opinion is is, is very very important as well you, you know monoculture is unlikely to get you to interesting yeah, 100%. places. Yeah 100%. Can I ask you a bit about the social currency one I was quite kind of interested in in and just exploring that a bit more about you kind of doing things get talked about kind of a different way to the rest of the, the category and some of that probably is is maybe down to the, the creative as well or the communications piece how closely are you working with communications creative agencies as, as part of this because to me it feels like the two have to work pretty strongly together because or i could be wrong <laughs> No, no, you're definitely not wrong. I mean, it's one of the reasons I wanted to come and work here. When I was talking to um, to Jenny Bigham, who's my boss, early on, she said that two thirds of our new business recommendations come through creative agencies. And when I was at network agencies, often you spend your time fighting creative yeah, yeah. agencies to like who had the best idea, you know. So that was really refreshing to hear, and um, it's certainly what I've what I've experienced. You know, having a no client wants fighting agencies. Every client wants agencies to work together and um, and, and come up with uh, come up with the best possible work and. Equally, you know, most people at creative agencies don't want to do vanilla work either. So it's, you know, it, it's really important. That said, I think, um, you know, we've been moving more into a full service space ourselves okay. as an agency. So part of my goal for Bountiful Cow, my sort of grand ostentatious three-year plan, which we're 2.4 uh, years into, was to um, diversify the business so that we could um, uh, deliver creative. And we're launching today, actually, we're launching our first TV oh, yeah. ad. Um, for um, uh, for well soon, which is a brand we created from scratch for a company called Practice Plus Group, which is amazing. So, with help from the team at Supernova, the um, uh, uh, Seven Stars, to to do that, and we've also launched a, a brand consultancy business called BC Squared, um, which has you know become a major major part of our uh, part of our revenue mix um, as well. So, um, we we uh, we absolutely think it's you know it's incredibly important, and I think we have to think that most. You know, if you think about when you try and explain to people in the real world that you work at a media agency, they don't know what it is. And people don't see media no. and advertising; they see yeah. they see it together. So you have to think about it in that in that context. You know, the, someone said to me the um, the role of media. Uh, you could describe it as if I sent a text message to my mum saying "Happy Birthday, Mum." She'd probably be really pissed off. But if I send the same message attached to uh, some flowers and some chocolates, she'll be really, really, really <laughs> pleased. And I, I think that, that, that kind of encapsulates the, the whole thing. That's brilliant. I think it was Rory Sutherland that ha has said that kind of the worst thing that ever happened in Adland was the breaking up of media and creative because they used to be together. And, you know, it, it yeah. kind of it got broken up and you can see the advantages. Of um, so it. I, don't know, I, I think I agree with Rory to an extent, but I also think you know, there's a real like a, a brilliant functional relationship between a creative agency and a, a media agency is a brilliant thing you know you going back to the point about diversity of thinking you don't want group mm. think and you know and, and that's that that's really important so that that creative tension can be an incredibly healthy thing and we love working with um our creative partners we learn from them and you know it, it, it's when it when it's at its best it's an inspiring thing but for some clients it's it, it makes sense for the um uh, for it to be much closer together and to be able to to, to execute um uh, execute the same idea so it's really coherent all the way through so yeah it, it's it's we haven't had we've got we're lucky enough to be blessed with um some really brilliant creative talent within our business so i mentioned you know, supernova team at seven stars and um we've got matt buttrick who's a kind of creative strategist working in, in bountiful cows so we've got the the kind of chops to do it so um it's not been a, a difficult transition you know we've got three creative clients uh, already now and you know we're, we're producing work that we're that's proud great of. and are there others that kind of like it's because again it's quite like again the space of the kind of the challenger brand thinking is interesting and are there are there others like in the us are there other agencies doing this or are you kind of is the 10-year plan global expansion 
<laughs> well, of course, yeah, Bountiful Cow Conglomerate. Um, you know, obviously, you know, mentioned BBH, you know, and we were lucky enough to have um, uh, them join us at our event in the uh, at the IPA to talk about um, what they do. And, you know, it's, of course, there, there are similarities and there's, you know, we, we, we admire the work um, they do. We we just want to kind of plow headlong into 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 our seven spaces and take, take that principle forward. So we're, we're kind of, I guess what we wanted to do without wanting to sound too grand about it was to... Um, uh, obviously, it's for us. It's it's our business, but to sort of like put a flag in the ground for being different because we think it's you know the challenge that every single brand faces. If you boil them all down, and you can talk about data and you can talk about um, uh, uh, business growth, but fundamentally, the the thing we all, the challenge we all face is of being ignored. And if your brand is ignored, it will fall between the cracks. And that's in the, in the competition for attention is the thing that we all need to focus on. So I think that um, as as far as uh, uh, you know. Brands and businesses and agencies alike all need to think about how to how to address that challenge and and um, how we can stand out. Yeah, it's. I mean, look as you said, there's a lot, so much work done on kind of the the attention economy, and I've had Karen, you know, on on the podcast talking mm. about it, and it's. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a very. It's just an important thing to think about is fleeting attention, and you know how how people consume, you know, the media because like, look, I'm. TikTok for me is like a just it's a bizarre one. Like I mean, I I started putting stuff up on TikTok. I'll be honest, I kind of stopped because like oh my god, people are watching about two seconds. <laughs> They're like I'm just like no, oh, I'm no. gonna I'm gonna leave. Well, that's enough to be counted. That's enough to be counted as a view in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a completed view. Yeah. Um, look, I'd love to talk about a little bit about <laughs> some of the work that you have done and but things that you've kind of done that you've really proud of maybe taking bigger bets and kind of but really really paid paid off for for bountiful cow and their clients <laughs> yeah yeah definitely i think i mean um one of the clients we work with is called newman and um we uh who are branded they're, they're basically in the men's healthcare space but predominantly focused on erectile dysfunction and um they've got a brilliant in-house creative team um run by a guy called paul coleman who's who's brilliant and that category is kind of characterized by real stereotypes. You know, you can picture the ads now of like erectile dysfunction as if like, you know, men sat on the end of beds with their partners consoling hand on their shoulders and they're, you know, looking at the floor. And um, in that space, uh, Newman produced some ads which basically were just euphemism for penis. Okay. And they were, you know, there was an ad with a chicken that just said, cock, get yours fixed at, at Newman. There was an advert with a sausage that said, wiener, get yours fixed. And we took the wiener ad and put it on 96 sheets in Westfield. And, you know, this is, this is a category that's historically used, um, uh, you know, kind of like you know, bus advertising or tube car panel advertising. And it's like, it's small, yeah, it's, it's discreet, it's yeah, almost yeah, yeah. embarrassed as, as, the, as, the, as, as the thing is. And we just thought, no, let's, let's blow it up and, and, and put it in, in, into, into the high profile spaces. So that's, that's been, a, that's been a, a great brand to work with. We work with um, La Familia Rana, um, who are a uh, Freshfield pasta company who are just going on this amazing growth uh, journey at the moment. You know, we're, we're proud to be partnering with them on that. But, you know, the first um, uh, meeting we had with them, it was the, that that category has been so entrenched in um, in, in kind of uh, tropes and media behaviours. It's all advertising in food magazines and all the ads for Italian pastas are all the same. Like, you know, images of nonnas and trattorias. And, you know, and it kind of felt that it wasn't really keeping pace with this sort of really vibrant, exciting food culture that we have um, nowadays in, you know, in, in the UK and beyond. And we kind of went to them and just said, well, you know, modern food culture happens not in magazines it happens in tiktok and it's not in restaurants it's in street food and it's you know not um recipes it's tutorials and so we, we kind of accelerated their um uh, their, their kind of media body language into those into those new spaces and um we've um we, we we took them away from advertising at weekends around supermarkets to you know midweek in um commuter um areas because it's all about you know picking something okay. up on the way home but making sure we had something really fresh and vibrant and interesting to to to, to put in front of them so we partnered with mob kitchen to create kind of 10 minute miracle mess recipes so you know stuff that people could replicate really 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 quickly and easily at home but was characterized by kind of um really brightly lit 
food photography that kind of was a world away from that m s food porn you know, yeah, sort of yeah. dark imagery you used to get like you know 10 15 years ago to to something that looks um colorful fresh and vibrant um, and more in keeping with with the now and then the big leap i think it was we we, we kind of we, we talked a lot about street food culture so we created them a street food van and um we took that out um on uh, 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 on tour and uh, you know actually used that as a sampling opportunity and took it out to um, the spinning fields in Manchester and Granary Square in, in King's Cross so that we could actually be, be be part of that world and it's um, it, the body language of the brand has completely changed and we've you know we're they're, they're on a really exciting journey with with distribution in, in Tesco okay. now so and you know we're, we're we are in a we're in a great that's place. amazing and it's um and it's great just from the way you're talking there as well it, it sounds like you're incredibly close to the business results that are coming out of the work that you're doing, which I think can often, not often, it can sometimes be a gap where the client or the brand doesn't necessarily share that with with the with the agency. Yeah, going back, um, I remember I was talking to someone about this yesterday, but about 25 years ago, 20 years ago, I was sat with um, uh, my boss, Paul, at the time. And um, we first started hearing about econometrics and measurement because before that, we didn't really didn't really know right and um we looked at each other and i said oh hell <laughs> you know the the, the 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 house of cards is going to come tumbling down be now for, time for neighbors know. now <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly yeah no one's gonna no one's gonna believe us um but it's been it's been uh a, a phenomenal thing because it's it's great to show the value of your ideas to, to clients business and if you get it right and i think um we're coming here one of the things i first noticed was there were whatsapp groups dedicated to celebrating clients business results and keeping an eye on them and i think that's that's incredibly important because um you don't want to feel that you're you know delivering something peripheral yeah. or you know ephemeral it's it, 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 it media is a, a crucial ingredient to the success of our clients business you know i, I joked about media vest but media is yeah, an yeah. investment and it makes a big difference and but to be able to to be able to show that and to be able to um uh, kind of restate the value of, of of building a trajectory towards towards growth and helping clients you know put measurement frameworks in place where we we all we're all clear on what the milestones are that unlock greater investment is an incredibly important part of it and then we're very proud to grow alongside our, our the business yeah and, it's, and you're right that point about it, it it unlocks investment and it kind of helps everybody along along the way right it helps the client put the, the value because like again clients that are having those conversations all the time so everyone kind of working together will will just provide the data and, and look it's not um it's not kind of as my old one of my old bosses said kind of marketing marketing like it's actually the truth as well because you know you have to know what's going wrong as well to be able to kind of course correct and and fix and i guess then it helps with kind of more long-term sustainable relationships with with clients which is what every agency wants and i think clients really ultimately want as well i think yeah i i completely agree i think um you know going into that uh, the, the kind of measurement space with, with the kind of no bullshit attitude which we do have is important because you you know you, you can't just go in there and, and claim everything was a success because it isn't and it's about what you can learn from and take forward and we're so lucky because we're backed by um uh, an incredible um, effectiveness team led by Billy Ryan um, uh, who's part of ARC at, at the Seven Stars he, he gives us this incredible capability to to almost answer any question with 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 confidence and and an alacrity so yeah it's um it, it's I, I would say it's coming back from media agencies after seven years at, at media owner it's it's the area i've seen the most development Brilliant. listen adam thanks a million i found the you know the, the results and kind of the, the the outcomes of what you did fascinating not an easy task kind of going through all that work either <laughs> like you know those case studies uh and you know incredible to have those insights and look i think from challenger brand or non-challenger brand there's seven principles that i think anybody can can look about look at and think about you know and, and as i said earlier it's probably start with one you know and then it'll lead you to yeah, yeah. the others um would be would be my my thoughts on it so thanks a million for joining me today and that's what i call marketing it was a real treat chatting to you and uh thoroughly enjoyed your sliding doors moment post glastonbury <laughs> thanks thank a you connor well that wraps up a truly insightful conversation with adam from sharing his unique journey into the world of media, starting at that spur of a moment decision at a train station post Glastonbury, I love that story, to delving deep into the approach to challenger brands and the importance of embracing innovative strategies in media. 
Adam has definitely given us a lot to think about. The seven principles laid out provide a guide for brands to navigate the complexities of today's advertising landscape with creativity and purpose. A huge thanks to Adam for joining That's What I Call Marketing and for sharing such invaluable advice. I hope this episode inspires you to think differently and challenge norms. If you enjoyed it, please do rate, review, and of course, share it with your peers, your colleagues, your friends, your family even, uh, and let them know about That's What I Call Marketing. Be sure to tune in for new episodes every Tuesday. And of course, check out the archive on That's What I Call Marketing.com. All of our previous episodes are there, right from the very first one with John Goldstone just over two years ago. Some amazing episodes in the archive. So until the next episode, from me, your host, Connor Byrne, thank you for tuning in. Thanks to The Indie List for sponsoring today's show. Visit theindielist.ie to find out more. If you would like to reach an engaged community of marketing leaders, get in touch with That's What I Call Marketing to discuss sponsorship opportunities. Are you facing the maze of global expansion? Diplomat introduces the diplomacy model, a cost-effective, innovative approach to navigating the complexities of your brand's presence in international markets. Visit diplomat.agency 